Alrighty. I think the light's coming on means it's time for me to start. Um, so, uh, thank you for coming. My name is Mark Baker. Um, I'm uh, giving a talk here called Understanding Where Value is Created in Your Business with OpenStack. Um, and the, the kind of basic premise for this talk was uh, because I work for, uh, in fact, let me put this slide up. I work for um, uh, Canonical, the company behind Ubuntu. I'm, I'm the OpenStack product manager, and I see I've been to the, coming to these summits for quite a while and work with many customers who are deploying OpenStack and um, have seen lots of behavior where people are investing lots of time and energy into OpenStack, and that's great helping further it. But I aren't necessarily convinced that, that, that they're, uh, they're helping move their business forward. Not because OpenStack can't help them people move their business, but because they're expending lots of energy in certain areas which may be spent um, elsewhere to help their business. And so that was part of the motivation. It's not a technical talk uh, uh, at all. It's, uh, it's, it's mainly about how I think you can look at value uh, and how technology can help that value and how you can channel your resources appropriately. So as I say, I'm the product manager for Ubuntu OpenStack. Um, uh, my background is sales engineering, or systems, systems administration, actually, to begin with, sales engineering, then doing some marketing stuff. Um, and uh, I rarely get to do anything else now other than look after my children. So um, who knows, or who, has, who can have a stab at what the greatest human instinct is? Sorry? Death? I guess that's inevitable, right? <laughs> right? I'm, not, I'm not sure it's something that we instinctively uh, 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 strive for. But uh, any, other, any other suggestions? Fear? I'm so, sorry, fear was that one? Yeah, survival. Or survival. Um, I think those are, those are all good answers, right? But um, I, I, you know, to a degree, and, and we can certainly argue this out or discuss it offline if you like, but it's doing that which is familiar, right? So it's behavior. Doing regular things, uh, things that you are used to doing. And, you know, like routine is, a, is the enemy of time, right? And we, the, when you get into routine, things go very, very quickly. Time goes very, very quickly. But we all kind of get comfortable with routines because we know what we're doing and we can't mess it up too much. So, um, and, and I think this conference, you know, the summit rather, is uh, an awful lot about behavior, right? We are here because we want to uh, uh, learn from other people and change our behavior. Um, but that can be hard. Learning can be hard. Uh, we want to try and influence the direction of OpenStack, get other people to change their development behavior. Um, and we're also uh, uh, trying to understand what cultural behavior changes we need to make to be able to take advantage of this new way of thinking, this new type of technology. Um, to kind of illustrate this point, right, um, is the, I don't know how well that comes out in the picture. Uh, is, the, is this kind of question of how do you train an elephant to be secured to a post? Right. And um, the answer to that, does anybody have an elephant? No. So the answer to that is, is that um, when, the, when the elephant's very young, when the elephant's very small, they use a big, thick chain to uh, chain it to a, to a big, thick post. And the, the, the small elephant, the baby elephant, will try to get away, but it can't. And um, they'll keep doing that until it basically just gives up and accepts the fact that it's chained to a big post and it's never going to get away. And then by the time the elephant grows up, as it goes through, um, it's, I don't know, whatever the equivalent of elephant teenage years are, um, and uh, uh, grows up, it's developed the sense of learned helplessness, right? As long as it has something tied around its leg and that thing is tied to a post, it's not going to go anywhere. And it's never even going to try because it tried for years and years when it was younger, and it gave up because it never went anywhere. And so, uh, so there's, thus you can see elephants tied up to very small trees with bits of rope that they could easily pull down and walk away. But it's this sense of learned helplessness. And of course, that's how many of us in our organizations um, are, right? And, and the trying to, to break away from that, change that behavior is very, very hard. And we, we, we have that, it's almost you know, like the safety blanket, if you like, that reassuring, comforting thing that's, that's chaining us and keeping us uh, doing what we've been doing for a long time. So let's talk for a second about strategy. Who has an IT strategy, business strategy? Nobody? <laughs> People have come here to get one. So I think um, 
uh, you know, everybody has a strategy about how they're going to use technology. Every business has a strategy about, um, uh, or thinks they have a strategy about how they're going to take their business forward. Um, and, but I, I don't know if, if, if people have genuine strategies. What we see is an awful lot of jargon, right? And if I've set this up right, we should hopefully see this sign, right? The strategy jargon generator. So if we go and generate a new conversation, copyright to whatever website this is, which is very, very good. But a lot of people will have strategies that are based on this. You know, we're going to differentiate our, our opportunity, must approach our challenge operationally, and achieve whatever that is, our market leading performance deliberately, right? And we can carry on generating strategies like this. And you could, if we went and edited the words, which I won't do now, but change some of those words to include flexibility and agility and operational excellence, we could probably generate strategies that would be applicable to all of us, and we'd nod and say, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do that. So um, an awful lot of what people have about strategy, I have to try and find my presentation again. An awful lot of what people have uh, about strategy is um, uh, it's kind of the what and the where and the how. Um, a lot of people have an open stack strategy, right? And that open stack strategy will look um, if we start with a blank canvas, we'll say, okay, the, the strategy is going to begin with a POC. We're looking at then moving into deployment. We'll have sets of app migration. We'll look at you know, building and buying various components in and servicing uh, um, applications on top of that. We'll be looking at getting support processes in place. Right? And all of these things are very good, uh, the what, the where, and the how. Very good at saying, this is how we're going to be able to have an OpenStack cloud in time. What they're less clear about is the why. Right? Why, why is everyone doing OpenStack? Well, a cynic, not necessarily me, but a cynic may suggest that because everybody else is doing it. Right? right? It's, you know, you look like me. I like what you do. I'm going to do it myself. Um, because it's cool technology, right? If you're a technologist, like all of us are to, to some degree, um, the fact that it's new and it's interesting and it allows us to do some interesting things makes it cool, right? The sense as we walk around the summit over the last few days, feeling that we're part of this kind of you know, technical gang or technical club, right, where we understand these problems that other people don't and we're the ones that are helping fix it. That all goes to, you know, to make us feel good about ourselves and make us feel good about the technology. But also, this is a big deal, I think, in the OpenStack world, right? Because it boots my resume. And we see this all, I, certainly in, 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 say, working with Ubuntu, I see this all the time when we go and talk to customers, where there's sets of operators and devs in a room that are really excited that they're going to get to work on OpenStack, right? Because it's going to boost their resume and they can go off into the city and earn thousands of dollars a day or whatever it is. Right? And in fact, I remember going back to San Diego. It was the OpenStack Summit in San Diego. And I had um, somebody from Red Hat came along and thanked me for Ubuntu doing so much good work with, uh, with OpenStack because it meant that, um, that Red Hat was now getting into OpenStack. And he got a chance to go and work on OpenStack. And he felt that was going to make him very employable elsewhere. So, um, although still with Red Hat, I have to say that. So, the other bit is case, case study logic. Um, you know, if a company X does Y is successful, if I do Y, I will be successful too. Right? And there's lots of, you know, a lot of the management books you buy um, uh, will talk about those great sort of pioneers, if you like, of, of certain types of business model. Um, and, you know, you look back over time now, it's quite amusing. You can go and read case studies of, People like Blockbuster and Kodak and, and, and AOL and Sun Microsystems and all the great stuff that they did that you should do because um, uh, you'll prosper like they will. So, um, but of course, it, it doesn't necessarily, one, you don't necessarily want to copy them, but two, it doesn't necessarily follow that if you do what they do, you will also be successful, unless your business is exactly the same, in which case you compete with that company and therefore you don't necessarily want to copy them either. So. Again, I think a lot of people are doing OpenStack because they see other people doing OpenStack and being successful. Um, but I'm not sure that's the right answer either. So I think part of this is caused by 
a lack of situational awareness, right? What is it that um, OpenStack means to me where my company is today? And to be able to do that, you need to, I think, have a clear understanding of where you are. Most of us know where we are by looking at a map, right? Or a GPS on a phone, but basically a map. So, um, and we don't do a lot of, a lot of mapping in, in this world today. So um, I'm going to take a little time to talk about uh, uh, value chains and, and, and value mapping, which is a concept actually that's been developed by an ex-canonical chap called Simon Wardley, which is, uh, uh, I think, kind of the interesting piece. So most of us do are looking at OpenStack, hoping that OpenStack is going to be able to enable us to do something more cheaply than our competitors, right? We may not necessarily think of it as being more cheaply than our competitor. We may think of it as being more cheaply or cheaper, I should say, more cost effectively, if I was in marketing, more cost effectively than the other system that I'm using today. Um, or we may be looking at bringing new services to market faster than our competitors or faster to market than we are currently able to do today. And, and again, I think most of us would agree that you know, OpenStack is either going to deliver both of these or one or the other, depending on how you want to implement it. Allow us to do something more cost effectively, or allow it, us, us to do things faster. Maybe it will deliver both and we'll be happy. Um, so why, why do we use OpenStack? You know, what, is it going to really deliver those things? Well, um, there's a gentleman called Everett Rogers who uh, developed this theory, I can't remember what it was, 50s or something like that, about the diffusion of innovation. And that most uh, innovations will follow this, um, this standard adoption path. This is a standard adoption cycle. So innovators, the people that are, uh, are leading edge with this, about 2.5% of the overall usage will, will be the beginners. Then we move into early adopters of 13.5%. Then the early majority, and obviously we're entering the middle of the bell curve here, uh, the later majority that come along, and then the laggards, the people that are very slow to move um, in the end. And so it, it doesn't matter, this, this theory can apply to software, but it also can apply to, to just about any other innovation, right? So a, electricity, for example, or uh, lighting, or radio, or TV, or any of those kind of things. Anyone got an iWatch? No? No one's running up to that? Okay. We're missing that 2.5%. That was going to be my winning example, but clearly a fail. So, um, but, and I think, um, you know, where does OpenStack sit on that curve today? Not quite sure why my build isn't working. Oh, there we go. Um, I think we're kind of there in the early adopter phase. Anyone agree with that or disagree? No? So I think we're still early adopters. Even though we're 6,000 people plus here this, this week, um, and there's a lot of big company names, you know, OpenStack's still a very small part overall of how people are... Uh, and managing their infrastructure. Certainly people running in production is a very, a very small part today. So um, we need to think, but we still need to think why are we doing OpenStack, right? Why, what value is it going to bring? Is it, I hope it's going to bring me cost benefits. I hope it's going to bring me agility. But why do I need OpenStack to deliver those things, right? If I want cost benefits or agility, why is OpenStack going to do it versus something else? Well, let's look at this. Um, uh, the adoption curve. And I didn't make this point, actually. The yellow curve, so the bell curve shows, obviously, how people are uh, adopting technology over time. And, you know, the yellow curve here is showing how, um, uh, in terms of the total number, the total percentage goes to 100. And so as we move towards the, uh, the right-hand side, as you're looking there, uh, we get towards 100% of adoption. Um, let's hopefully, if I got this right, break this down. So in that beginning time frame, Apologies, you can't see the line very well there. Let me try and do an edit in real time. Is that better? Yes. Good. So. Um, Looking at that line, you'll see that in the beginning is the genesis, right? And this is the, where the, you know, in the OpenStack world, this would have been NASA and Answer Lab and, and people putting this together, right? The genesis. And so the early adopters, the innovators that are taking that on. As we move forward, then we go into custom products. And so um, this was still back in the early days of OpenStack, people taking uh, packages 
um, you know, certainly in, in, in Canonical and Ubuntu, we were starting to package OpenStack, put that into archive, but putting it all the pieces together to create an implementation uh, required smart people with experience to do that. So it wasn't a product, it was a set of packages, but not an integrated product. But that's the next stage in the adoption cycle, right? Which is uh, where you have products. I think we're just kind of getting there now in OpenStack, right? With OpenStack distributions creating products that are targeting certain people, certain use cases in certain ways. Um, and then uh, the final stage is commodity, right? And this is where it doesn't matter what shape, size, color, flavor of OpenStack you get, it's a commodity service. It's easily installable, it's easy to, 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 to run. Um, you can switch between vendors seamlessly and easily, um, and it's a commodity product. And, and of course, there's a great many examples of commodity technologies out there, whether it's you know, Intel-based servers, you should be able to, I'm probably gonna upset people from HP or, or, or Dell now, but you should be able to switch between those Intel vendors relatively easily and get the similar uh, level of service. It shouldn't matter to you whether you're getting your power from one power company or another, it's still power and it's still going to work. So those commodity products uh, enable you to be able to negotiate much better on price and deliver services more cost effectively. And as I say, I think OpenStack's kind of here at the moment just moving into that product space. There are products out there that will work, but you, uh, you're still going to need expertise and smart people to get it running. So, um, the challenge for us is how we move it up to here. And this is us as the OpenStack community, and an awful lot of the talks that we have today about how, uh, you know, this week about improving it to deliver greater functionality, improving it to uh, uh, deliver um, simplicity of install, simplicity of management, all of those other pieces. Um, and we as users are very interested in that, because the faster it gets towards being commodity, the faster we're going to be able to derive more value from it, right? We're gonna need less expensive people, or fewer expensive people, I should say, um, uh, to be able to run it and manage it. We should be able to negotiate between the different distributions and get a good price and get a good deal. So that strategy, you know, I wanna be able to do it more cheaply than somebody else. I wanna be able to launch a service faster than anybody else. I think these are very good reasons why people are doing OpenStack. But let's uh, add another dimension onto that. So, um, I mentioned value chains earlier on, and this is a value chain for a, uh, a relatively simple web service. Um, and we start at the bottom. In order to be able to deliver that service, um, we're gonna need power. Uh, we're gonna need some servers. They're gonna be co-located in a data center. Uh, we're gonna need a platform of some shape or form and description to, in order to be able to develop that platform or add value to it. We need development tools. From that platform, we'll have a web service. And um, just simply, I've got you know, payments and, and a banking system. That web service is obviously going to generate money for us in one way or another. Uh, and then the secret source. I tried to think of a, a smart example here, but I couldn't, so I just thought secret source. Um, but you could, uh, uh, that web service, I don't know, you could think of Airbnb or whatever, I don't know, but a web service um, that is uh, adding value that, you're, um, that you know, nobody else is offering or very few people are offering. And of course, the closer we get towards the top, the greater the value to our business it is. Now, even though we wouldn't necessarily be able to run it without power and servers and data center and dev tools and all these other pieces, the value is in the secret source, right? That's the bit that differentiates me running this web service from somebody else that's running that web service. Um, and at the, uh, 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 we've got customer needs. You know, as a customer, I'm a customer of the power, a customer of service, but then uh, towards the top of this, I'm a supplier, I'm supplying my secret source uh, via my web service to end users or customers. Right? Hopefully that's relatively easy to understand. So if we start to map that against um, the, uh, the diffusion of innovation, right? the stages that people go through as we're looking at this technology, um, it allows us to be able to, if I've got this right, Let's simplify it a little bit, so because it just illustrates the point a little better, but let's take away the, those outliers, the pieces that we need, the servers and the, uh, and the power, uh, sorry, which was it previously? Uh, dev tools and servers, the banking system, right? Those are our kind of utility providers. And if we start to stretch it across the environment, we can start to map that value chain across those different strata, if you like. So 
Uh, the commodity pieces, payments, right? There are very many different ways of processing payments, managing payments. It's a commodity service. Even though you'll get charged for it, but you can jump between different payment providers pretty easily. Power, as I already said, is a commodity, right? Um, but as we move further up towards the top in that value chain, the platform has more value, right? And likewise, the web service. And at the top, the secret source is where all of our value lies, right? This is the differentiator in marketing speak. So um, we map those across these different strata. Um, we can say, well, these things are commodities, so we just go to utility providers for them. These pieces are things that we should be looking uh, at products for, existing products. These pieces are custom build, or even, depending on how secret our secret source is, it might be the genesis. It might be the innovation. We might be the only people in the world that are developing this. Right? And so the key here is choosing the bits that we place, right? How do we do them? The utility providers, well, we should probably just outsource that, right? Very little margin in me managing that myself. There's no point in me generating my own power. That's just expensive. But there's no point in me, little point in me managing my own payment system. I may as well just go and let somebody else do that. And likewise, data centers, unless you're very big. I know there are very big people here this week. But unless you're very big, just go in somebody else's data center, rent a bit of space, right? and benefit from the economies of scale that they can provide you. So outsource a lot of that. Um, the product pieces, go and buy, ideally off the shelf. Yes, you may have to pay some margin, but go and buy off the shelf or obtain off the shelf some products. You needn't necessarily buy them, and I'll come on to that in a second. But the secret source is where you want to um, uh, put your resources, your in-house resources, your smart developer resources on developing that piece. Um, is this all making sense for everybody? Anybody disagreeing with this? No? Good? Um, so I think, again, the platform in this context, in this example, would be, would be OpenStack, right? And part of the challenge today is because uh, an awful lot of OpenStack has been custom development. And I see an awful lot of very big customers that are still doing a lot of OpenStack development. OpenStack development is great, and I'm very glad that a lot of those big customers are doing so. But an awful lot of them are developing OpenStack in-house to suit their particular needs, and not necessarily pushing all of it upstream. Some of that's because they want competitive advantage, supposed competitive advantage. Some of it's because they don't know how to push it upstream. Right? Some of it's because they think, oh, it's only relevant to me. It's not going to be relevant to anybody else, because it's to work around our own broken in-house IT systems. Um, but I think that's, that's a waste. Right? It's a waste. And I'll come on to that a little more in a second. Um, the value, as I say, is all at the top. Um, as an open source guy, I think the, sorry, the shading hasn't come out pretty well there, but the, um, those mid-tier components, those products, should be open source, right? So even though you're getting them as products, and you may even be buying them from someone, the fact that they're open source is going to um, help you push them in towards this commodity section faster, right? Open source generally is developing fast. Open source means everyone has access to it. Any competitive advantages between different providers of open source technologies are relatively short-lived, right? So I think these areas uh, should be open source. So value, the secret source is that business value, right? That's the thing that allows you to charge your end user customers uh, money. That allows you to differentiate from your um, co uh, competition. And OpenStack is that product if you're doing it right, if it's in that mid-tier and it's a product, is that product that allows you to be able to get faster time to business value? It should be, anyway. The speed is the important piece for a lot of people. I think it was a couple of summits ago, wasn't it, where they had, um, if you have to try and make that trade-off between um, uh, cost uh, speed, or was it availability? Take speed every time. Because with enough speed, you can the other two become less important. And so, I don't know if that's true necessarily, but certainly being having speed, being able to deliver things faster, in our, my experience talking to customers, is what they see greater value with OpenStack than perhaps cost reduction. So, um, but measuring value is going to depend very much on how you, as an organization, um, your particular state and the particular things that are important to you. So I think the time to 
to, to value reduction. Um, and by that, I mean not reducing value, but I mean the time to business value. Being able to implement a new service quickly, uh, whether that's external and you're charging for it, or whether it's just making your developers or, or in-house um, uh, more efficient, that time to business value is one of the key advantages here. Um, it can be cost reduction. Uh, but then point three, and again, we see this a lot, is attracting or retaining developers. There are OpenStack projects out there that are specifically to ensure that um, the company X is attracting or retaining what they see as key operational staff. They don't want to go and lose those people who want to go and work on a, a, a fancy new OpenStack project somewhere else. And even though I think there was it in one of the job board surveys recently that uh, the highest paid developers in the world were on Wall Street programming in COBOL, um, most people leaving university right now, or leaving college right now, uh, want to work in you know, some exciting DevOps startup-like environment, which means if you're a, a dusty old corporate, you've got to try and present yourselves as being uh, an exciting, interesting place to work, and OpenStack can be one of those ways. So maximizing value. Um, if you're not selling OpenStack, but you're spending a lot of time developing it for in-house use, you're wasting resources, I think. I don't think you're, you're making best use. You should be, because those, those pieces, they should be products. You should be focusing on the value that you're able to deliver higher up the chain. Um, so that means focusing developer resources on the new technologies, right? The bits that are going to make a difference to your business. Um, and the bits that are going to uh, transition to commodity quickly. And so back in my diagram, excuse me, flipping back so quickly, those web services, those platforms that are open source will transition to commodity quickly. That's where um, uh, you want to spend less of your resources and keep focusing higher up in the value chain. But this doesn't mean that you shouldn't contribute to OpenStack. But contribute to OpenStack as part of the community, as hopefully you are doing this week, um, because then it is going to transition to becoming commodity faster, and hopefully it's going to deliver more of what you need faster to enable you to be able to deliver that secret source, that high value applications um, more quickly uh, for less money. It's very difficult though, I see very enthusiastic teams in, organi in organizations that are developing OpenStack. They may well be doing it on Ubuntu, they may be using our packaging, but then doing other bits around the edges and tweaking it. And you think, you don't want to discourage them from being excited and working on OpenStack, but at the same time, I'm, you know, it's dubious as to whether it is delivering value for them. So that was, I've uh, gone through that a little quicker than I thought, but um, that was how I wanted to try and position this. Look at value chains, look at the, the pieces of your organization, understand where the value for your business lies, and then choose which pieces you outsource, which pieces of products, and where you actually spend your developer time. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Right. Do you mean do you mean in terms of chargeback, for example, chargeback models or that kind of thing, or or? Okay, and well, I know that there's, um, the, there are definitely companies looking at that, and whether that's via um, app catalogs, for example, so you need to be able to go and get XYZ service as an application. Um, uh, I think Murano is trying to do some of that, but then there are 
uh, third-party orchestration tools or deployment modeling tools that, that, that will offer similar app catalogs to be able to do that. Um, but I think you kind of raise an interesting point in that an internal IT department uh, is often competing with Amazon, right? So it has to be able to both compete cost-effectively, but also in terms of uh, feature function-wise, right? Make it easy to consume and um, uh, provide a lot of those features. And so, uh, yeah, I think absolutely. And maybe as a, as a community investing time on how that's where the, you know, often that value is delivered, right? In the application layer higher up the stream, maybe. Um, uh, yeah, maybe we need to we need to look at more of that. Yep. Right. So I always struggle with that, to try to bring them along. Short of a mistake of taking over, it's something could be really difficult for someone to abandon what they know. Right. Yeah. And so I think that I mean, there's two, two, two answers. To, well, there's multiple answers to that. But let me pick on two points. Really, one is that any change from this needs to be, even though OpenStack often starts bottom up in an organization because it's developers that are have easy access to it and playing with it and see that it can help them and solve some problems, or they want to build a resume or whatever it, it is. Um, but in order to be successful, it needs to be driven very much top down, right? Because only top down can you make people make the changes. Often in organizations, storage, networking, computer, different, have you know, different managers, they're different departments, different groups, they don't really like talking to each other, and then you have DBA teams and these things too that add additional complexity. The only people that can force them together and say you need to work it out and, and uh, is is executive teams, right? It's management teams. So one, you need to have need to have that buy-in. Um, uh, and two, the, um, uh, the the kind of the funding model I think changes here, right? So um, people organizations typically are very sort of verticalized in how they charge. You know, if you want space on this, then you're going to have to pay for it, and this is why you see in, in investment banks, for example, different um, you know, e equities or fixed income or whatever it is, uh, applications have their own machines, have their own environment, because they're able to then to accurately measure the value it's delivering to the business. It's not a shared resource, although I know that that's changing a lot of the time. So have, you have to implement not only top-down push, but also have sort of changed some of that structure from a, a, a corporate mindset to do that. Good. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. No, it's okay. I can hear. You. I'll repeat the question if uh, if need be. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. So. So yes, great question. So, so I think I mean the the time to value, if, if you like, is just being able to launch services faster. And uh, even I was I won't mentioned the customer. I was talking to a customer just very recently this week. They're saying that to be able to launch a VM takes them a day, but, but to be able to configure all of the, the networking components around that um, through the various teams can take um, weeks. Right? So it can still take four weeks to be able to get their application set up with the right config, uh, the networking uh, config. Now, I know this is the ideal world, and we don't live in the ideal world, but when you have software-defined networking and the right tooling to be able to allow people to to, to deliver that much faster, then that time to value should be reduced, right? Whether it's going to be reduced in minutes, I don't know. But uh, to be able to launch a VM and have that uh, network configured dynamically via some smart soft uh, SDN tools, um, I think we should be able to do. 
the cost is still a big issue, right? Yes, you can get, there's no such thing as free, even though we talk about free software, you know, there's no such thing as free because everyone's um, uh, time costs money. So uh, I think it's always difficult to say, and I will avoid that conversation as much as I can about is OpenStack cheaper than VMware or a, another different technology, right? Because um, uh, your mileage is always going to vary, and, and it uh, depends on the use case. If you've already got operational processes built and designed around tools from others, then it's a very hard uh, discussion to win over, right? Um, I think you can say, though, that very often people will look at the migration cost. If I'm going to move from uh, application um, X onto, onto uh, or platform Y, as it were, then um, the migration costs are prohibitively expensive. I may as well just stay where I am. And uh, that may well be true at a kind of spreadsheet level, but you need to view that migration cost as being almost the cost of lock-in rather than the cost of migration, right? Because otherwise you'll stay on a platform forever. And that may make sense for you strategically, but don't view it as being um, uh, the, uh, um, the right, necessarily the right way all the, all the time. Great. Any other questions? We good? Thank you very much.